Michael Tessarian, ancient researcher, occultist, investigator, Jordan Maxwell. Two heavy hitters in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Okay, let me introduce our two guests tonight. Michael Tessarian, an expert on the occult histories of Ireland and America, and is the author of Atlantis, Alien Visitation and Genetic Manipulation, The Irish Origins of Civilization, and The Astrotheology in Cerebral Mythology. He is also the producer and presenter of the Origins of the Oracles DVD series, Exploring Ancient Mysteries and Forbidden Knowledge. Here he is, Michael Tessarian. Hey, Michael, how are you? Uh, I'm very well, George, and I hope the same for you. Likewise, uh, my again. friend. Good to hear your voice. All is well. Looking forward to this one. Any? Oh, indeed. Uh, I'm inundated with emails about this show and uh, <laughs> lots, of, lots of support from... It's just been overwhelming in the last couple of days, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this is, you know, a record show for listening, because, I mean, I just can't keep on top of the emails that have been coming in on it. Well, I love it, and we've got our friend Jordan Maxwell with us, too, Michael. Let me bring him in. Uh, He continues, as everyone knows, to be a preeminent researcher and independent scholar in the field of occult and religious philosophy, and uh, he is back with us on Coast to Coast. Jordan Maxwell. Hey, Jordan, how are you? Just great. George, good so, to be back on uh, with on the air with you, and especially with Michael. Absolutely, Michael. This is a very special moment for you and Jordan because you you truly requested Jordan be with us tonight. Tell tell us a little bit about the, your background and relationship with this guy. Well, you know, it, it does. It's been central to my work in the context of the conspiratorial movement. It's been central to my sojourn in America, certainly since 1990. Basically, um, we've come full circle, you know, by putting out the book on astrotheology. You know, the, of course, Jordan's obviously mentioned in the book. The book is obviously dedicated to him and so on. But it goes so much deeper than that because there's no way that that book or, you know, I would even go so far as to say that even my Irish Origins book would not be, you know, as strong as it is. Uh, pr- probably all my work, you know, all the, any, any of the DVDs, anything that people can focus on that I've produced and created, you know, I always think of Jordan uh, as being, you know, absolutely fundamental, his his message, because you see, when I had come, uh, I've been researching, well, even from an astrotheological point, mm-hmm. I've been studying that subject maybe 10 years before I'd ever come across Jordan. But the thing was, you see, is that this is such an immense subject. Of course, we know it's controversial and all of that. I mean, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be on the show right now. But not only that, just from a purely academic point of view, it's complicated. There's so many highways and byways. There's so much disinformation. In fact, one of the reasons I put this book out is because people are telling me that they find the subject somewhat impenetrable. And then when they go on the Internet or when they try to look for sources, you know, they have problems. Well, that is very much my situation back in Ireland you know, all the way through the 70s and 80s, not having the whole, you know, it's, it, maybe I can describe it like I had a lot of beads, but I didn't have the actual thread, you know, and it wasn't until about 92 that somebody brought in a video that had a talk that Jordan had done in L.A., and uh, and then it also had, they also brought a video, which was when he used to run the International Research an educational society, and they had put together a brilliant, what I always consider a masterpiece in this world, and that was called Egypt Light of the World. It was a title borrowed from the great Gerald Massey, and I just jumped out of my chair, George, because, you know, Gerald Massey had been one of the great mentors. This is the English scholar from the Victorian age. I've been studying him, and never had I ever come across anyone else, you see, who had even heard of the guy, let alone mentioned him, and was now critiquing his work. And I sat and watched, you know, this two, three-hour presentation that Jordan had done in which he literally had uh, images, photographs, scans of Gerald Massey's monumental works. He had the table of contents. He had sh- he showed pictures. He was describing this man's work. And then I suddenly realized, I've got to get hold of this man, you know. But, uh, you know, being from England, there's a certain protocol about the way you approach, you know, great man and and it's pretty trepidatious it's pretty scary (laughs) and then to uh, my horror i found out that uh you know later on of course i would understand why all of this was taking place uh uh, jordan had been you know done over by so-called friends and uh, i think at that time he his wife had sued for divorce and had basically banned him from coming home completely seized his his, you know belongings uh, had court orders etc so jordan had gone through 
I couldn't basically get hold of him because, you know, he was uh, utterly undercut. And it took another year or more, I think. I mean, I had these contacts who had his videos, and they showed me more of his work and told me what a researcher he was. But I was hungry to, you know, talk to the guy. And the numbers for the IRES in Glendale, California, were completely defunct, and, you know, couldn't get through. And, you know, this was, I was thinking, my God, this guy's fallen off the edge of the planet. You know, I mean, yeah. now we all know, of course, you know, with mortification, the way that this man has been treated. You know, I mean, I'm a stranger to this country, but I'm mortified by the way Americans dare treat this man who, you know, is the ground he's not, you know, fit to walk on. You know, we should be, you know, ashamed of being the man's shadow. And yet look at the way that, that, you know, the guy's been treated and all of this. But way back in the 90s, I didn't know any of this, you see. So finally, David. David Icke uh, had come to uh, do a, a talk, I think it was in uh, Redwood City, up where I lived at the time in the Bay Area. And, of course, I know David, so I went by him. And it was David that actually had his staff had Jordan's up-to-date number. So you can imagine that the following day, you know what I mean, at a, at a good hour of the day or whatever, my hand was – and I'm absolutely not joking here. I'm like, my hand was shaking, you know, <laughs> when I – you know, I'm a guy from Ireland, you know, come to a big country and talking to a big man here, you know, he's going to say, get your punk ass off the phone. <laughs> you know, so I, uh, I'm i really shaken, like, and I never forget the day. I mean, I know the room I was in. I know the house I was in. I know the street. You know, it's, a, it's burned into my memory, right? And I'm thinking, okay, like all great men, he's going to be a pompous ass, you know, uh, sort of my Irish, you know, uh, skepticism sort of came out, you know. But then what happened was I picked up the phone. I said, look, Jordan, uh, my name is Michael Tassian. You know, I'm... I do lectures, I do talks, you know, I'm, I do some writing. And I just want you to know that I'm out there because some of my work, you know, is a little bit similar to yours. It does deal with these themes. It does talk about Gerald Massey. And I don't want you finding out from some third or fourth party that some punk in the north up there in San Francisco Bay Area is, you know, cutting into your territory or like that. So I'm on the phone. I'm talking to you. And all I want to, you know, you can cut me off. You can hang down the phone. But just know that I exist and that I came to you first. Because you'll never hear from me from some backbiter or for some, you know, Jack who's stealing your information and trying to set their stuff up, you know, their reputation on your, on, your, on your back. I understand that you're doing this, and I want to let you know that I'm out there, you know, and I love this subject matter. And that's how we started conversing. And then we had Gerald Massey in common, you know, and the man was so gracious and so loving, and he could hear, he could hear me. He wanted, you know, mm -hmm. he listened to me. So when I put on the table all these missing links, you know, and I said, I'm inspired by your videos because, I mean, that, that's doing the trick and everything. And Jordan basically then became a mentor, you know, in the sense that he started to, to create that thread, that golden thread that holds the beads together, you know, to show how this works with the symbolism, how this works with the uh, designs of cities and the alignments that we're, you know, we're talking about and how this, how ancient belief systems uh, were co-opted by those we refer to today as the secret societies and how those people have cannibalized this ancient knowledge, how they use it for their own benefit, and of course that means then the disbenefit of everyone else of us, you know, the, the, the disbenefit of humanity. These are sacred teachings, sacred truths being used by, you know, unworthy people when it should in fact be common knowledge to the masses of mankind for their spiritual and intellectual and moral uplift, you see. So this man started to put the background in the picture and basically led me out of the dark, you know, so it was unthinkable to come on with you, George, today, and I'm glad that, you know, I'm glad you organized this, because now that this book is in print, I mean, okay, I did my DVD back in 2006 on the same subject, and Jordan's heavily mentioned in that, but, the, you know, when, when you go to print with a book, of course, as you know, it's a slightly different thing, and, you know, to me, it's unthinkable to not honor the man and not, uh, you know, and as I say, I'm mortified by the way the man's been treated in the American context, so, you know, I'll not follow suit. I will publicly on this show in front of your 20 million guests or whatever, you know, absolutely, you know, loud and clear say that I'm the man's prodigy and, and uh, you know, this work is absolutely an homage to Jordan Maxwell. You well, know, well and if, if Michael and it's gotten worse lately in yeah. terms of, I think, higher ups, whoever they may be, because uh, Jordan's been on the program now. And Jordan, why don't you tell Michael... And again, so many people listening to you tonight. What happened that last full time we were on when your phone went dead? <clears throat> yes, uh, we, we got through about three quarters of the program. And then I started um, talking about a subject which uh, offended somebody high up. 
and immediately my phone was shut off by the uh, phone company. AT&T shut my phone off. And, uh, and, and I didn't know what to make of it, so I stayed on the phone thinking maybe it was just a glitch and it would come back on, and, cert- and it did come back on just a few seconds later. But this time there were people walking around in a small office. I could hear the reverberation of people moving around, so it was a very small office, and they were talking about me. And one of the guys saying to somebody else, somebody's going to have to deal with this guy somewhere. Uh, and it was kind of scary because I, I, you know, I instantly knew that, uh, you know, who is it that has the power to have the telephone company shut your phone off instantly if it isn't government? While you're on the air with While us. I'm on the air. And then I, I saw, I was hearing people walking around talking about me. And then I heard this one guy say, somebody's going to have to deal with him soon. And, of course, you know, that, that sends chills up and down my spine when I hear NSA or CIA uh, saying things like that because, uh, you know, you don't expect your government to be talking about you like that, especially after doing 45 years of research and study into the enemies of my country. I mean, I've never done anything against my country. I, I've spent my whole life trying to expose the enemies of my country. And so uh, that was very scary. And, and since then, uh, I've had I've had many different occasions where I'll be on the phone, and uh, and uh, they'll break in on the phone while I'm talking to someone, and I can hear people walking around talking, and then they'll sh- then it'll go off, and uh, maybe a couple three weeks later I'll be talking to someone, and boom, it'll go off again, and I'll hear people walking around talking. So I know they're doing that purposely to let me know that they know yeah. who I am, where I am, and let me know that whatever it is I'm saying, they're listening. And, of course, I told you before that a few years back I had an FBI agent in San Diego called me at my office in Glendale. And he told me, he said that I, you know, I was immediately uh, kind of shook when I heard this FBI calling me. And he said, no, this is a social call, not business. And he said, I just wanted you to know that the working class people of the FBI, the guys who are just working out here, he said, we appreciate what you're doing, what you're trying to do. And we, you know, we, have, we don't have any problem with it. And as of the moment, he said, as of the moment, your government does not see you as a threat because we know that people are hearing you, but we, but but as long as people are hearing you, you're not a threat. You will become a threat when people begin to listen to you, because then you will become politically, uh, uh, you know, important. So that uh, we might have to take a different look at you. But you know, Jordan, now they are listening to you. Well, I know, and that's what's scary because I, I I've told you this many times that I am worried about my life and my and myself right now, and I. I don't know what to do about it because uh, I, I know things that they know that I know, and I've never talked about it in public, and I never would. But uh, I know some very explosive things that uh, has never been talked about, and there are certain subjects which I can never discuss in public ever. Um, so I live uh, with this hanging over my head, and, and that's why. All the joy and the happiness of my life of 48 years of doing what I'm doing, uh, I started out really excited about. And if you go back to my old videos, you will see uh, a lot of energy. And, uh, and you know, I was really happy and excited right, about right. my work. It was a different Jordan Maxwell. Totally, man. totally. But after you get feds knocking on your door and getting threats from the federal government, uh you know, it just changes your whole life. It takes all the joy out of living. It takes all the joy out of my work. I, I live now in fear. I have fear of my own government. I fear the people who are in my government because I know that they know. <laughs> that you know. <laughs> that I know. And, uh, and now, uh, you know, and, it, and I've said this before, I was always uh, researching all of these secret societies that were enemies of my great country only to discover that these secret societies, which I have been researching all these years, are now in power. Now the people who I was 
researching as my enemies of my country, they are now in power. And now I am the, the hunted now. You know, now the, the hunter has become the hunted. Now I'm in trouble. And because they know that I know who they are and what they're doing. But it has gone much, much further now than just theology and religion, which, of course, was my first love. I have always uh, loved uh, spirituality, I've, and I should say even at this point that I don't have a problem in the world with the concept of God. I have always relied on spiritual protection. True and honored the spirit, and I, I have no problem with it. And, and I know you believe in a divine creator. No doubt about it. I mean, because I wouldn't, I don't think I'd be alive today if I didn't have divine protection for the work that I've done. And uh, so I don't, I don't have anything against spirituality. What I do and am known for, and I am very concerned about, is the, 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 I'm trying to think of a, of a polite way to say this, of the, uh, the corporate system, which we call religion on the earth, and who is actually financing the corporate system of, uh, of theology and religion in the world, the same people who have given you courts and educational institutions, banking and uh, totalitarian dictatorships of government, are the same people who are financing churches, uh, missionary movements, uh, religious orders in the world. Why, all, why would they do that, John? It seems inconsistent, doesn't it? Does it does seem inconsistent, but, uh, but once you understand how the church is connected behind the scenes to the ancient Templars uh, of Europe and the, uh, the Crusades, and begin to understand how Hollywood is trying to tell you something in these uh, Indiana Jones uh, movies with the Last Crusade, and always making the connection with the religious and the church as a you know, and, and connecting that to the Templars, to the uh, the occult secret societies of Europe, you begin to see after about 40 years of looking at this and studying it that the entire religious establishment in America and in Europe. Is a is a political, uh, economic, a political movement. Jordan, we're going to be back with you and Michael Tassarian, and we're going to get more into the occult and astrology when we come right back. And our two very special guests tonight, Michael Tassarian and Jordan Maxwell, and we'll be back with both of them in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. Michael, you've heard some of the things that Jordan's gone through, yet you're not going to stop. You're going straight forward. Well, there's nothing else, you know, you can do. And uh, this is about the only thing that I know how to do, you know, in this way. And But I'm, I will endorse what Jordan is saying because uh, in the last four to five days since uh, this show has been publicized, mm -hmm. both by your own producers and both by me to my own mailing list, sure. I've had nothing but telephone glitches. I've had nothing but email hiccups the likes of which I've never known before. And more than that, for the first time in its history, my forum, the MSAR forum, went down. I mean, we've never had a glitch like this before. And That's the whole thing so was strange. off the air. So yeah. strange. Only when we start promoting this show. I mean, you know, it's three of these things start happening. And I've been, uh, the even the uh, documents and, uh, you know, the book that I was sending to your producers and, and the emails I was communicating, they were just so glitchy. Nothing was getting through. You know, your producers were telling me uh, they weren't getting it, and I've never had a problem like that ever before. My form has gone down, the phone, you know, I mean, the, obviously, what Jordan's saying, there's there's really something to that, because people are very threatened by servants of truth and what they've got to say, especially in, in the times that we're living in now, you see. So I think so, we're getting closer to this one world government, and, and you two have touched on it. Well, exactly. And uh, and more than that, they know that people's uh, interest level, un their hunger for the facts. The, a lot of people are aware now, you see, that they haven't been told the whole truth. They are aware, like Jordan is saying, that we have domestic enemies and uh, that those enemies are very much wanting to finger 
uh, their rivals, you see, as anti-patriotic, when in fact the reverse is true. Uh, so coupled with the fact that we're able to, you know, I, I believe that, you know, spiritually we're in an age of awakening in, in which, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, we're going to have revelations on every level, both political, archaeological, you know, theological, you name it. And that this wave, you know, of revelation uh, and the work that we're doing, you know, is transforming the world and people's minds are getting transformed. You know, I, I've been inundated with emails about this book and how people who had not even heard of the subject before, in fact, to tell you the truth, the book was, you know, not planned. I mean, you know, the book was simply not planned. You know as well as I do that the Irish Origins was the one that I've been focused on in the last two or three years to get out. This book came as a, as a result of a lot of people saying, we love the DVD you've done, but and we want more information on this because when we go to the Internet and when we go to you know, other sources. Well, first of all, there's very few sources. In fact, this book, uh, George, is one of the first books to even have the, ter you know, the term astrotheology in the title. Uh, it's not the only one, but the, you know, the right. last one. The, I mean, five. We're talking five hundred. These are two. Ago. These are two volumes now, aren't they? This is a single volume. Single volume. Okay. Yeah, the Irish Origins of Civilization was a double volume. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You know, so there's 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 both a threat. Uh, to establish status quo, but there's also a wave of new information, you know, which is again old information coming, you know, through. But I always believe, you know, that uh, if you're a servant of truth, you have nothing to worry about ultimately because, you know, you're protected. And regardless, when you see your house burning, you've got to do something. You've got to move on that, you know, regardless of what kind of, you know, shadows and fears and, and other things that are thrown up. You know, one just has to plow on through like a warrior and, uh, you know, they can take your body, but they can't take your ideas. They can't destroy the great truth. They can't destroy the ideas. So, true. so you know, this is the most important thing, I think. All right. Tonight, let's talk about astrology and let's talk about the occult and how this deals with the things you've been saying. Jordan, your take on the occult. You're you're an occult researcher. Mm -hmm. Give me an overview of your perception of the occult. Well, first of all, the very word itself, occult, spelled O-C-C-U-L-T, occult simply means hidden. does not imply anything evil or bad or demonic, it simply means hidden. So uh, we know, and, and you know as well as I do, that so much uh, of real important information, the, the bedrock stuff, is has been hidden. I mean, the CIA knows things you will never know. NSA knows things that uh, that we as the people will never hear. So, so much of real wisdom and knowledge and understanding bedrock stuff has been hidden purposely because uh, the people in power always consider that kind of knowledge uh, on a need-to-know basis. And you don't need to know. All you need to do is do what you've always done, just watch basketball and and uh, the ball games and be entertained and watch television. You don't need to do any thinking on a, t on a, on a national level, international level, and start questioning the powers that be. They don't want us to no, think. No, they have no idea. No, they, that is like George Carlin said, that is not what they're here uh, to promote, is for you to be wise and intelligent. They're here to make sure that you have plenty of beer, basketball, sports, entertainment, and uh, and ripping you off in your banks and your money and keeping you frightened to death uh, from one day to the next if you can stay alive. And happily, they give you Hollywood movies and all kinds of entertainments. But the one thing that the powers that be do not want and they will not allow as a, as a nation filled with intellectually superior thinking people who can question. I mean, how would you like to declare yourself uh, I, I'm a dictator in a country filled with PhDs and, and educated people. I mean, how would you like to go into any organization and, and claim that you are the head of some organization that's filled with college graduates, PhDs, doctors? Uh, you know, they're going to look at you like you must be crazy. <laughs> that's true. And uh, because they're not, they're not that stupid. They're not going to buy anything you are saying. Uh, and so consequently, uh, that's what we are facing today. America has been purposely dumbed down and kept ignorant because uh, that just leaves the people at the top 
a lot of free room to do anything they want because they know, generally speaking, the people in America are so profoundly ignorant and ill-informed and entertained and lost uh, from uh, propaganda and lies and deception for so many years that at this point it's just useless to even try and find truth because it's so well hidden. And the word hidden, again, as I said, is occult. And nowhere do you find occultism more profoundly in your face than in theology and religion and churches and, and the, uh, the superstructure of religions throughout the world and their hidden connections to secret societies and fraternal orders that are financing, organizing, and directing religious movements into wars, into uh, crime. It's just an extraordinary story. What do you think, Jordan, of some of these evangelists, uh, television or oh, otherwise, who God, I mean, are making and reaping in millions of mil dollars? Multiple millions a week from, from people who just cannot wait to send money. And, you know, when I watch, sometimes I watch TBN or some of these Christian stations, and I will see these thousands and thousands of people at these huge churches and they're applauding and they're and they're entertained and they are dancing around and they are just having a great time throwing I, money yeah and throwing money at the ministers and the, and the, of course the ministers have got their their Rolex watches and diamond rings <laughs> and the $500 mohair suits are you sure they're real <laughs> well whatever <laughs> I I'm, I'm not sure any of it's real <laughs> And so, and then I think to myself, you know, the 48 years that I have spent uh, reading and studying into the world of the occult, mysticism, theology, ancient religions, the people, the religious people of America and, and the North America especially, have no idea in the world what is actually going on theologically or religiously. They have no concept of what is really taking place. They have no knowledge of the Knights Templars, of the secret societies of Europe, how the uh, European royalty set up, purposely set up religious orders to further their political plans. Uh, they, a classic example, and I think I've mentioned this before, but it's, it's, it's worth mentioning again. Uh, we talk about the, the dollar bill and, and the symbolism of the dollar bill of the pyramid with the all-seeing eye. Yeah. Uh, but what Christians do not know, and most people, period, don't know, is that in the Old Testament, the, in the Old Testament Bible, which is the Hebrew Old Testament, the Messiah is at least twice, I know of twice, referred to as the chief cornerstone the builders rejected. Now, that's not Jesus. The Hebrew is talking about Messiah, period. Now, in the New Testament, the Messiah is referred to, or Jesus is referred to, uh, by the same word. The same word as chief cornerstone, the builders rejected. Now, what's interesting is that all of Christianity says that Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. That is absolutely, totally incorrect. It is a total misreading of the word. Jesus, according to Scripture, is not the cornerstone of the church. That's ignorance to say that. Uh, the Scripture says he is the chief cornerstone, which that word in Greek simply means a triangle perched on top of a pyramid. That's what the word actually means in the Old Hebrew and in the Greek and Aramaic in the New Testament, a triangle perched upon a pyramid. Well, if that's the case, then that symbol on the back of the dollar bill has to do with the Jewish Messiah or Jesus uh, as the Christian Messiah. And how many people know that? That, that? that whole symbol on the back of the dollar bill is a very powerful religious symbol to Jews and Christians a thousand years ago that today we have no idea in the world what it means. We're calling it Illuminati. We're giving. Up, we're talking about all the uh, of bad, evil implications of that symbol. When, in point of fact, it's the symbol for Jesus and in the Hebrew for the Messiah. Now, what in the world is going on with the Messiah and Jesus being the symbol on top of a pyramid? What does it have to do with Egypt? 
And why is America connected to Egypt? Why is the Mississippi River called the Great Nile? Why do we have uh, cities along the Mississippi given Egyptian names like Memphis, etc.? So you need to understand that there's a world hidden from people in theology and religion which they have never been privy to know, and which the Templars of Europe and which the masters of wisdom and the ancient world knew, but they've kept it among themselves. They're not telling. Well, why the symbolism, Jordan? Why well, the well, hiding of the symbolism? Well, symbolism is very, very uh, important way of communicating in the occult world. I mean, uh, you know, gangs do that. They give hand signals. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah. And, uh, or spray paint certain symbols, and you drive by and think it's just junk. The kids are spraying on a wall. No, no, it's not just junk. Those are symbols. And if you don't know how to read those symbols, you can get yourself in trouble. And so symbols are very important. They are, they are hidden messages. I mean, like uh, I, I've said so many times before, Hollywood is telling you it's in your face. The new Batman movie is just filled Dark, with Dark uh, Knight. Somebody's telling them, though, then, right? Somebody is feeding America occult knowledge, wisdom, and understanding on a very high level, and we are accepting it as Americans as entertainment. It's not entertainment. The, the symbol on the dollar bill is extremely important to the church and to Judaism throughout the world. And uh, the symbolism in churches and in, in synagogues, and why do you even call the Jewish meeting place a synagogue? Where does that word come from? I'm just saying that there is a world of hidden knowledge, which is one day, like the Scripture says, that which has been done in the dark will one, be, one day be brought to light. I believe it is now time for the dark mysteries of religion, theology, and the occult world. It is now time for the people to awaken, to find out we have been lied to. We have been misled by the same people who have led governments, led the banking institutions. They have led the educational institutions. All of the institutions of learning around the world, the same people are the ones who have given you the dollar bill and the symbols that we live by. And unfortunately, in America, nobody seems to see the importance of the hidden symbols right in your face. Do you agree, agree with that, Michael, that uh, most of the people just don't seem to understand these symbols? Well, this is what we call symbol illiteracy. People can walk around the, you know, the streets, they can walk around the towns and cities, they can uh, observe the stately buildings and the plazas and the, ch and the church design, the clock towers. And even the murals. I mean, look. Let's look at the, you know Washington D.C. So they can be in the midst of all of this ubiquitous ancient pagan symbolism, and not have the faintest idea what it means. And therefore, by not knowing what it means, the subconscious mind is wide open to, as Jordan is saying, be manipulated. See, neither Jordan or I have any problem with Christianity. Neither Jordan and I, uh, uh, you know, have any problem with religion. What not we have a problem. Yeah. What we have a problem with is absolutely Luciferian. Masonic, Templar, you know, individuals, dynastic concerns, power elites who are either biologically or ideologically descended from some very, very ancient sorcerers who are hiding behind what most people would know by certain terms like Christianity and so on. So that the definition of terms like what Jordan is explaining is extremely important, you see, because otherwise people will think, oh, wait a minute, you're Catholic bashing. Wait a minute, you're Jew, Jew bashing. Uh, wait a minute, you're anti-patriotic, you see. So when, when an occultist like Jordan and myself are talking about these things, talking about these terms, talking about this subject matter, we are not doing it as you will pick up a newspaper and see it or turn on PBS right. and, and right. understand it. Or even for that matter, you know, with, for, with the schools and the colleges, university, the so-called academic expert level, we're not experts in anything. You know, we're not looking at that professionalism. We're not, we don't have letters after our name. We don't have any bias. We're looking at something in an esoteric way as opposed to what's called an exoteric way. So, George, to answer your question is most people do, in fact, see a lot of this stuff, uh, but they see it in an exoteric way. It's just a symbol on a product for them. It's just a certain, you know, color or a certain rhythm or a tricolor flag, you see, or a double-headed eagle that they pass every day, you know, or an obelisk that they stand up, uh, you know, in front of to get some shade or, you know, go to, go to uh, you know, uh, 
Piccadilly or, you know, whatever, take a photograph of the lions there. It never crosses their mind, you see, to say, why is it lions instead of giraffes? You know, why isn't it four, you know, rabbits sitting here? What, what's the lion doing on the, on the symbol of the British royalty? What's the fleur-de-lis, you know? And, of course, in an American context, it's important because these oligarchical forces, and these Luciferian uh, concerns are, are really in control now of the American system. They have have eviscerated the Constitution of the United States. They are, they are the true foreign power that's ensconced in America. This is why you have the Queen of England coming over and shaking hands, you see, with, with your dignitaries over here, uh, scandalous uh, certain things going on in the political milieu. I think the only thing that maybe I am a little bit different than Jordan is, you see, I, I don't necessarily really expect the whole of the world to ever really understand what people like we're, what we're talking about right here now. Every listener who's listening to my voice, who's listening to this show, is a select group of critically minded, open minded people who know that they've been lied to, who suspect, you see, and these are these 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 people may think, may forget to understand how rare and unique they are, you know, from from being into this kind of material. It's not it is occult. You're occult. To listen to, the, to this information is occult because it's not going to be something that you're going to share with the guy next door, you see, and even many, many members of your family. No, you can't. You know they, they, would, they would think you were nuts. Oh, right. No. So yeah. this, is, this is another definition then of what I mean by occult. We've all gone through it. I'm sure you have. Uh, you know, even the researchers in this field have, have um, suffered this in their own you know, family uh, dynamics and whatnot. And, of course, the people who come to us you know, to read our materials and, and uh, uh, look at what we're doing also have a tremendous problem with this. I see it on email every single day, you know, uh, the people calling out for help. What can I do, Michael? Nobody listens to me. They think I'm a complete crazy, you know, and then I keep reminding them of this esoteric, exoteric divide. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, you have stepped over into the black square on the board. Because as we know, the Masons and these people, these elites, use the checkerboard. They use this incredible symbol. What does it mean? It means exactly what Jordan has been saying, ignorance and knowledge. The only two categories in this world that a top Mason or any of these elites ever think about, how they categorize us, how they categorize the human race, is simply in two categories. Those who are ignorant and those who are you know, knowledgeable. And they make sure that when they initiate their people and their lodges, that's what they're doing. That's why they use the symbol of the sun. Michael, give I us do. give us a website. We're going to hit the uh, top of the hour, and we'll be right back. But give us I one just, of your websites. MichaelTassarian.com is the navigation page to all the different Great. sites. It's also the navigation page to the Astrotheology book. Very good, and that's linked up at CoastToCoastAM.com. Jordan Maxwell, of course, JordanMaxwell.com. We'll be back with more with these two incredible people on Coast to Coast AM. I've got to tell you, over the years, I have learned listening to Jordan Maxwell on Michael Tessarian. I've learned a lot, and there's more to learn when we come back on Coast to Coast AM. Michael Tessarian, for you, what was the revelation? What was the beginning that got you into this? Well, that happened back in about 1980 when I uh, made a trip to California and had uh, some mentor at the time, you see, had uh, been talking about uh, language, had been talking about etymology. I mean, you know, it's like full circle. Here we are again talking about the same thing. But yeah. this journey, uh, you know, you're right on with a question because right back then I got interested in something. You know, that's why my message also goes out to the young to say start, you know, also getting interested in symbolism and, and, and the mysteries of language. I know I certainly was not interested in too many things, you know, but that, that got me interested. And this fellow, uh, this mentor, American gentleman, actually a great artist who worked for Bill Graham, um, a very well-known man, he, he, he had a tremendous knowledge, uh, George, about the meanings of words. He also knew a lot about English words, English country, you know, towns and villages, and, and, and sort of like Manchester and Chichester, you know, I mean, he would just go on and on about the meaning of words like Belfast and Dublin, <laughs> and this completely fascinated me, because I never, you know, we're not brought up in school really to look at words like that. I mean, okay, academics know about linguistics and stuff, but there's no magic in that. You know, that's a science and what have you, but there's a romance of names. There's a romance of language. There's a total other aesthetic, you know, a sort of, a, like we're saying, esoteric approach to this. And um, I was only, of course, 14 and 15 at the time, so, you know, a lot of it was new to me. But what had happened was that the, this mentor had written down the name of Gerald Massey, the great Victorian, you know, scholar, Egyptologist and poet and whatnot. And when we had to leave America you know, and go back to Ireland, we were only on holiday there. 
Oh, of course, I thought, you know, it's a simple matter of going and trying to find Gerald Massey's books, you know, and to my horror, you know, nobody had heard of the guy. You know, I couldn't find anything in those days by him, and the librarians just couldn't care less. You know, they just want to kick your ass down the steps, get out of here, you know. Um, and I started to realize then, uh, of course, it's a slow process, that it's not just a matter of this information being available. There's a suppression action at work. It's like what Jordan has been saying in the last segment. You know, it, it wasn't, I mean, you asked for anything else, any cheese ball rubbish, you see, and, and it's immediately provided for you, you know. But obviously, even a 15-year-old can work out that, wait a minute, if I'm going to the leading university libraries here, if I'm going to the leading bookstores, if I'm going to, you know, and of course, in an Ireland and British context, you even have some antiquarian libraries that, sure. you know, yeah, that should have this work, and they don't. So you're sitting there thinking, well, wait a minute, you know, what's going on here? And then it was only... You know, later on, that I actually got the works of Ger Gerald Massey, and to do that, I had to come back to America because, you know, here they have these books uh, slightly more available, even though they are suppressed and sequestered works. And that's what started it off. This was my introduction to astrotheology and to some of these larger issues, and also a deep, more a deeper investigation into the meanings of words, which I emphasize again is connotative. It's not necessarily an academic one. So when people read our work, they sometimes get confused, because we're again looking at, at all of the subject matter in an esoteric way. That is a bit of a phase shift for a lot of people. You see, who are coming out of the schools, who are coming out of listening to so-called academic experts, who's, uh, you know, in my opinion, their 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 understanding of the world that they live in. And and even some of their own subjects, is extremely myopic. It's also highly prejudiced because these people have sacred cows, you see. They have allegiances, which none of us have, you know. So when people, you know, I, I do see that when people come into the subject matter, there is a little bit of a learning curve for them, you know, but they should be open-minded and not realize that we're not treating the subject in a normal referential way, you know, like a street level way. There is a different kind of approach to this. It is more right brain. It is more connotative. Okay, maybe it lacks some of the rigor of academica, but we make up for that with the scope and the scintillation of what we're looking into, you know. And again, to emphasize the point that I was making before the break, is I don't believe that all the people are ever going to be ready, you see, for this. I do believe it's a small, you know, demographic of of aware and, and enlightened people who are mm -hmm. looking for the truth who are going to come our way. So I don't get bothered and hot and bothered, you see, about the state of the world per se, because I know that this is sacred knowledge. Those who approach it have to approach it sacredly. If you don't approach it sacredly, it's not going to it's not going to happen. The magic will not happen. It won't mean anything to you and it will back you off. We don't need gates, you know, guard, guardians at the door. Your own toxicity is your is your is your is your bane, because a person who does not come to this subject matter with a reverent mind, with a uh, you know a holy mind, a religious mind, because you know as I said, this is this is a, a type of religion, a type of theology. It's it's an immense self discovery here. It's intellectually thought provoking, but it's also spiritually essential. You know the work that we're dealing with here is essential for the whole of the spiritual you know, development and maturity of mankind and astrotheology as a specific subject is the vertebrae. It's the backbone. It's the subject of subjects. It's the vertebrae of all the other subjects. Once we understand how much has gone into it, not just the symbolism and the temple designs, uh, but the words and the phrases you see and the symbolism, you know, that Jordan has been exposing and talking about, the meaning of, of words, so many of the tropes that we see being used in royalty, and specifically when it comes down to dates, George, when certain uh, civic, political, you see, date, dating, why does this politician, sh you know, go over to this statue on this particular date? You know, mm -hmm. why is he standing in front of this mausoleum? Why did they initiate this, you know, rule or, 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 or political uh, change, like, say, the euro dollar, for instance, you know, or, or the declaration of war? We, we're talking about things that are happening before our eyes that are actually dated based on an old a stellar zodiac that you and I and the world are not meant to know about. You know, we're meant to know about the little poxy, uh, 12 signs of the zodiac and all of that. Or we may be buying products, you see, that have these ancient astrological symbols on them that people just laugh when you say that. They, they, they don't understand it. They don't understand there's an entire occult world out there by which very demonic people who don't mean you well. These are people who are there day and night dreaming about how to control you through lack of knowledge, uh, to make your mind so convoluted, you see, by all the pornographic rubbish that they're pouring out through the you know, media and through the suppression of knowledge and all of these things. They're at war with consciousness, and they're doing a marvelous job. And so we have to become immune to this. 
And the only way to become immune to it is through knowledge, through awareness of these occult matters, to become aware of what is lying behind the scenes, to empower ourselves with the very same gnosis, the very same knowledge, the very same um, understandings that these few elites, and they are few, they're not many. We are many, they are few. But they have empowered themselves with occult knowledge, and the time is absolutely ripe now for that to turn around, and we take the light that these people have blinded us with and that they love to hide behind, you know, and turn it back on them and see how they like it when they're dirty little secrets. And, and they're not little secrets, they're big. They're like big dirty, secrets. Big secrets, yeah, when they're starting to be exposed. I believe that's happening. I don't go out to people to sell my work. They come to me. I see it from the people, you know, interest, their fascination, uh, that even in a beginner level. And I try to keep it like that. I try to keep it on a grassroots level. I try to make it, you know, uh, applicable to what's going on in today's world with lots and lots of, uh, you know, anecdotes of what's going on in our world because we're living in a bewildering time. And if you're not aware of some of the things that we're talking about, you're not going to understand what's happening around the world. You're not going to happen to understand what's happening in the, in, the, in the terms of religion or the whole circus out there, you see. So this is something that makes sense of the world that we're living in. But most importantly, it's spiritually, it's spiritually um, important for the individual's own spiritual understanding to understand the roots, the foundations of religion and politics and symbolism and all of these things. It's absolutely crucial. Jordan, one of my favorite lines with tremendous message is in the movie Network, where Howard Beale, played by Peter Finch, mm -hmm. said, you know, I'm mad as hell. I'm not going to take it anymore. And he came yeah. out to say, just, just give us our television and our toaster and our radial tires and leave us alone. Leave us alone. That's what they're trying to do to us. Yes, and I'll tell you, uh, <clears throat> I've used this example before. If you were a, a highly trained <clears throat> physician, a doctor in a particular uh, uh, discipline, and you went to a foreign country uh, and to a third world country, say, and you see people are, are dying from a particular disease that they don't understand, they don't know, but, the, but it's killing people. And you as a doctor have studied this disease and you see all the symptoms, you know exactly what's going on, <clears throat> but you are, uh, you know, you, nobody's going to listen to you. They have their own people to listen to. That's the same kind of thing that I have been experiencing all my life, is that I have been reading and studying the terms and the words and the symbols that the occult societies as far back as in, in the ancient world, the Egyptians and the Phoenician Canaanites, etc., <clears throat> much less the Greeks and the Romans, and then into Eastern Europe, the words, the terms, the symbols that were used by these ancient people are today being used right now in front of us, <clears throat> and most people don't even begin to know what they're hearing. They don't even understand. I mean, I'm just amazed hearing uh, uh, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, the words that she uses, the terms that she uses, Barack Obama's symbol for his for his uh, his uh, candidacy, for his uh, running for president, the symbols that he used. And McCain just blows me away when he uses certain terms that I know where he's getting those terms. Absolutely. And once you begin to, you know, once you are very familiar with the terminology that is used by secret orders around the world, the, the encoded words and terms, and then begin to see politicians and the people who are running for president at this very moment, Using those terms and words and symbols, it is appalling to me. It's right in front of your face, but you don't see it because you are not trained to see it. And and, and I'm, I'm just amazed. I'm watching the entire superstructure of this great republic going under, and people have no idea in the world what is going on. They can't read the symbols. <clears throat> they don't know what the hidden words and symbols mean. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know. And I have said to, to you before, it's like going into downtown L.A. and you see gangs are, are scribbling stuff on a wall. It's not scribble. There, are, there are symbols and words and terms there. And just because you don't understand it, doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning. Doesn't mean it doesn't have meaning. And you know as well as I do, when every generation of kids coming up can sit and talk in front of their parents 
and talk about all kinds of things using the lingo that the kids are using today. And the parents have no idea in the world what their kids are talking about. <laughs> Not at all. They could be talking about drugs or sex or something, but they're using the terms that the, that the kids know that the parents don't know. Well, that's exactly what how our masters who run this planet and who run our country are using terms and words and symbols that they chuckle to themselves, that they know what they're talking about, and they know that we don't. We don't even begin right. to know what these words and terms really mean. And sometimes they have multiple meanings in which they can, they, they're like chameleons. They can turn it around, you know, like a Rubik's Cube. So just when you think you got a handle on it, you know, or somebody thinks they got a piece of this, you know, suddenly it's changed again. And there's all these connotative shades and, and nuances, you know. I tell you, the, the people running for, for president right now in the country, all three of them are using terms that would knock you out. If I would sit down and go through them and show you how the same terms that are used by the three people, that are, by the two people, especially now, but especially Hillary Clinton, the terms that were used by them, the words they're using, I can show you the same words that were used during the French Revolution. I can show you the same identical terms that were used during the Reformation, during the uh, Renaissance. Yeah. I can show you the same terms that were used by the secret societies that were trying to overthrow the American Republic as, far, uh, as very founding. In your, in your opinion, Jordan, what do they want? What's the bottom line? I don't think it's money, and I, I, I don't think it's power. Uh, because they already have all the money. They can print it all. So and they, they have all the power. And they have all the power. <clears throat> no, I am totally convinced that the Bible is is right when it is when it's saying that there is something else going on here. There is a war not only for the minds of men, but for our very existence. I believe that there are uh, that there is in fact a war going on <clears throat> for the ownership of the human race. And I believe, like gangs, uh, the different gangs of Crips and the Bloods opposing each other, but they're manipulating the people in the city. They're living off of the people in the city. They're selling drugs to the people in the city, and they're manipulating those people. Well, I think that's what's going on here. I think that we have some extraordinarily powerful, wise, and shrewd people who are <clears throat> not interested in money or power. They have both. They are after our very souls. They are after the very life force of the human race. They want to absolutely consume and control the human creature, period. Are they Luciferians? Well, Luciferian is a very interesting word, and, it, and it's very misunderstood. Lucifer was quite simply, has nothing, all Bible reference works that you can go to any good Bible bookstore and go through all the, the Bible dictionaries, all the Bible reference works at these seminaries, libraries, which I lived in for years. And you will find that Lucifer was nothing more than the planet Venus. It had nothing to do with the devil at all. As a matter of fact, the very word devil is simply a D put in front of the word evil. It becomes devil. And God is taking an O out of good and becomes God is good and devil is evil. It's merely a use of words and terms, tricks. But there is something going on on a very high level, and it has nothing to do with what you think it does. They're not looking for political power. They're looking for the very life force. And this is what Hollywood is talking about. Spielberg is you know, did movies like uh, uh, <clears throat> War of the Worlds, where the subtitle for War of the Worlds is they're not coming, they're already here. I would suggest that maybe we are being invaded by uh, other world intelligences who are actually after our very souls. This is quite simply the hmm. story in the Bible. This is quite simply the story in the Hebrew tradition that there are dark forces in the universe. Um, you know, Christians call them evil, devils, spirits, uh, demons. I don't care what you call them, but the Bible very clearly shows in the Old Testament that uh, that they look like us. They look like humans. I mean, Genesis 18 and 19 talks about uh, three men that come walking up into the camp of Abraham, and they sit down and have dinner with Abraham, and then when they leave, 
uh, it says that that was the Almighty God, the Creator, with two of His accompanying angels. And in, and in <clears throat> Genesis 19, it goes on to say that those other two were the angels that went into Sodom and Gomorrah, and they were good-looking, handsome men. I'm saying that I believe hidden as a, and I talked about uh, hidden codes in the Bible years ago. I believe that there is something to this idea that we have been invaded by other world entities. Uh, I don't know what else I would call them. Uh, I don't know what other term would be acceptable. But I don't think that the world that we live in is being run by humans. I think that the people at the top of this world are inhuman. They don't give a damn about human life, about, uh, about Christianity, about truth righteous nothing they care only for the consuming of the human family to own and control the entire human population and unless and until <clears throat> you you begin to wake up and find out how big this thing really is and how frightening it really is you're never going to suspect how you've been had and been you know been misled by all the words and terms and symbols that are being used it's an extraordinary story. It's frightening. Uh, it is absolutely frightening. I and I have told you in private <clears throat> uh, that I would love to sit down with you, and we've talked about this before, and show you things that I could never talk about in public. Well, we may get our chance this uh, coming weekend. You're going to be in uh, Santa Maria? Right, and we're going to be doing a, 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 a UFO conference together. And you can go on my website to jordanmaxwell.com to uh, events and all the information is there of course it's on your uh, coast to coast uh, event also okay we'll be back in a moment with jordan maxwell we'll talk astrology with michael tessarian jordan has an incredible story he once told me i'm gonna have to bend his arm to have him share it with you about a ufo story when he was a young man we'll be back Next hour, we'll open up the phone lines, give you an opportunity to chat with Michael Tessarian and Jordan Maxwell. But when we come back, let's have Michael talk about astrology. And I definitely want Jordan to talk about this incredible UFO case when he was younger. We'll be back. Michael, your take on astrology. I have a feeling it's not just looking at stars, planets, and the constellations. Well, it is, but it's uh, fundamentally looking at consciousness because in the ancient days uh, unlike today nobody was fooled by thinking that some sort of you know floating rocks in space was affecting destiny and all of that kind mm -hmm, of palava mm -hmm. and nothing could be further from the truth you know and uh, that's why my work goes into this thing called the inner zodiac, which basically turns astrology, or a good part of astrology, on its head anyway, but in a positive way. But uh, in the context of astrotheology, what we got to deal with, uh, one of the things that ties it in with uh, you know, what we've been talking about in previous segments is this, you see that we are familiar maybe with the 12 signs of the zodiac, you know, and everyone knows their star sign and so on. But not too many people are familiar with the fact there's, a, there's a, another at least 72 constellations in and around the same zodiacal belt so right near the familiar signs above them below them you see nearby side by side etc there are these other very important constellations that we no longer know about people would only know about that if they had studied the ancient you know um astrographs or you know they have this interest in the archaic aspect of it but what do we find when we look into the corporate world what do we look when we find when we look into products you know, the educated eye starts seeing these uh, symbols, these these symbols, because of course, obviously, if these marketers and and the, and the uh, secret societies and so on, the people we've been talking about, if they just continually use the same old twelve signs of the zodiac, pretty much we, even the dumbest person would catch on that there's something going on, right? So they <laughs> yeah. they're smarter than that. They're smarter than that. So when you're looking at the orange order of Northern Ireland, which is, again, you asked earlier about how did I get introduced to this. Well, mm -hmm. my God, in one way, living in Belfast is probably a very important part of that because there is so much architecture there. There are these special events, you know, that are timed 
to coincide with the summer solstice and what have you, you see. Sure. And then all this Masonic symbolism of the ladder and the coffin and the donkey, you know what I mean, and the red hand of Ulster and also and the harp of David and just the whole thing is so symbolically rich. And, of course, other people come from cultures where they have similar, um, similar sort of rites and rituals and whatnot. But the thing is that, you know, I start to look at this and go, well, you know, what do these mean? This, 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 there's, a fr- there's a frickin' skull and crossbones on this symbol over here. Well, what's that all about, you know? or the number 13, I had a curiosity to find out why are they even using this color? I mean, they call it the Orange Lodge. But, the, you know, then I found out that the orange is connecting to the House of Hanover, you know, the famous Dutch royal families of yeah. the past, you know. So I'm, I'm, I have pattern recognition skills. I started to put all this together. As I said, you know, it was in my own sort of chaotic way until Jordan came along and said, look, chump, let me iron it out for you and show you where this thing really, you know, goes goes along. But... Uh, Basically, you see, astrology became a fascination because, as I said, it's the root. It's the root and the shoot of the whole thing. You know, you're talking astrotheology, astrology, when you look at the corporate symbols, when you look at, uh, and not all of them, obviously, there's chance in everything, but we're talking about a meticulous, um, you know, archive, a corpus of knowledge that has been dipped into by so many of these secret societies and so many um, politicians and, and all of this kind of thing. In architecture, it's very, very important to realize that France, Cologne, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, you know, have been meticulously designed to align with certain constellations, to align with certain stars and the rising and the, and the setting of these stars. You know, people like even Richard Hoagland have gone to the, into this. David Overson has gone into this. Uh, you know, in recent times, you you have uh, even uh, Graham Hancock, you see, has explored this. He went into the mm-hmm. study of the designs of Paris. Uh, London, of course, let's not forget London. And even, uh, it, it's just fascinating. People can get onto my uh, forum. If they go to the Watts new page of the forum, they'll see a presentation I did on the Queen's coronation. This is the coronation of, uh, you know, back uh, of, of Queen Elizabeth II when she was coronated. And and I have a slideshow. It's free. People can look at it and, and see what I'm talking about, about the alignments and the geomancy and the sacred geometry that's involved. But it all goes back to astrology and astronomy. Th- this is the key thing, you know, about how many steps she walks the design of, you know, the podium, uh, the various implements and, and regalia that is being used, the symbolism, everything right down to the choreography, right, everything right down to the very day in which the coronation was done. You see the zodiological signs that it was done in. There's so much to this. It's a rich archive. So when people plunge into this area, they're going to have a lot of answers about the things that are going on in the world. Why it's empowering, of course, which I said earlier on, is because, you see, once you've dived into this and you get, you get a handle on it, you start to understand two fascinating things. You understand that it is powerful. It has to do with consciousness. It has to do with an awareness of the macrocosmic mysteries that are all around you, including the mystery of God, you see. And you realize then why these elites, whether they, you want to call them Illuminati or Luciferian or whatever, you know, the, the terms in that instance, you know, you can pick your term. But you understand why these power brokers want to use this information and want to use this occult knowledge because it is powerful. And the second thing you learn is basically how it can start to empower you in your own life, in your own business, you see, in your own educational uh, pursuits, in your own awareness more than anything else. Because if you change man mentally, if you change him intellectually, if you change him rationally, you know, everything else in his life changes. His relationships change, his understanding of politics, the world, you know, of how to treat other human beings, how to understand his own mysteries of his own selfhood, you see, how to come into a closer rapport with the creative force, you see. All of this matriculates. All of this goes up several notches. It upgrades the person's entire awareness because it is literally turning them on. I mean, there was an anecdote, Jordan talking earlier just reminded me of this fantastic anecdote in the work of uh, Conan Doyle, you know, in one of the Sherlock Holmes stories. Very early on in the story when Watson, Dr. Watson and Sherlock Holmes had just met, and Dr. Watson was very much in awe of this great genius whose observational skills, you know, were like uh, incredibly honed. Right, right. And uh, he was trying to learn. He was trying to say, teach me this. You know, how, what's the difference, man, between seeing and observation? You keep talking about the difference of just seeing and, and true observation. And he said simply, well, you come to Baker Street, you come to visit me, Watson, you know, in the fiction. The character said this. And he said, you run up the stairs. How many times have you run up the stairs to come into my room, you know, to see me? He goes, maybe hundreds of times. He goes, how many stairs are there? <laughs> of course, Big silence. Yeah. You know, the, the character Watson was unable 
to say, well, I don't know, what, what does it bloody matter anyway, you know, how many stars there are? He goes, well, that's what I mean about people who see and people who observe. That's what the Bible means when it says having eyes you see not, having ears you hear not. All we're trying to do is turn people on to the art of seeing, not the mechanics of seeing. The, you know, the eye is going to do its thing because there it is. It's created by something higher than you, a higher intelligence created your body. And it has a mechanical autonomous system, you see, that will always perform. But there's also the art of life. There's the art of seeing, the art of hearing, the art of observation, you see, and deduction. We're not saying we're right. We're saying you find out whether we're right. You go and do the research, do the homework, you know, and pick up with this and take it on maybe into areas we have never even conceived of, you know, because this is what is happening. The people that, you know, I know I connect with by Internet and through the forum and people who, you know, talk to me, that's exactly what they are doing. You wouldn't believe the research of people who've picked up you know, and so many people that my work has inspired, just like Jordan inspired me. And there's a network. I mean, people who check out Google, YouTube, you know, Generation, they see this. There's so many great uploads now. There's so many great videos on symbolism. And people are taking in the areas, you know, that I never, ever considered. And that's fantastic to me, you know. I love that. I love the fact that this is branching out, you know, and we have colleagues uh, going around their own cities, going around their own towns, taking measurements, looking at the designs of buildings, finding out, going and interviewing leading Freemasons, you know, finding out, inquiring, not through fear, not through trepidation, but through curiosity, you know, because curiosity and, and the drive for knowledge is a very, very powerful instinct within people. And that's what, remember you asked earlier, why, why are they doing this? Why would they be doing this, this to us, this terrible insinuation of the poison? It's so that we slowly fall asleep, gradually, slowly, you know, the mind gets dull, People get caught up in the domestic minutia. They get completely, you know, sort of bamboozled. They stop thinking. They don't even like to, to pause between thought. That thinking is something that almost takes too much time. You know, we're in this sound bike sure. generation. You see, so it's a drip feed, drip feed, drip feed of constantly trying to lower the person into their lower drives, into the confusion, into the miasma, so that they, they are not able to see the truth, you know, which is all around them. This is the thing. So we have to counterbalance that by continually applying, you know, the antidote and continually trying to make people immune to this spiritual poison, this psychic tyranny that is absolutely ubiquitous in our world. And it's there, and you have to understand it, like Jordan said, like a doctor, like a scientist, you come to the village, you see that it's there, and then you must deal with it rationally. You can't you run around, you know, with your hair on fire. You've got to go step by step and try to save as many people as you can individually, you know, and then when you've turned those people well, hopefully they will go on and vaccinate, you know, or heal the other people. So it's a growing group. We're in the early, early stages of this. It's not something that's, uh, you know, developed. It's very new. I mean, look at Jordan Maxwell. You're talking about his own life story. How many other Jordan Maxwells are there in America? Very bloody few as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, me too. You're dealing with a, yeah, you're dealing with a very short period of time. He spawned a lot of interest in people like myself. Then it moves on to the, you know, the next sphere and the next sphere, and we move on. And we try to present these works and these DVDs and videos so that people get a crash course because we obviously understand that, you know, people don't have the time, George, for the 30, 40 years of research that Jordan's done, you know, maybe the 25 years of research I've done. They don't have that time. And that's fine, by all means. It's our job. It's, you know, the responsibilities on us to create the products and the, and the books and the teachings that go out and people can have this then, you know, in a compendium form in which they – you know, it saves them all of that time so we can get with the gig of what's really going on in our world, you know. Jordan, I want you to share with us that incredible story you told me at lunch many months ago when you were a young man about the, well, I can't say what he was because that is part of the story, but uh, with the girlfriend of yours. Oh, well, let me say a couple of things first. Right. <clears throat> One, and I'll get back to that. Um, I have so many people that go to my website but don't seem to be able to scroll down to see what's on my website. So I'm just saying to everybody, when you go to my website, which is jordanmaxwell.com, scroll down and go through all of the, the various boxes of research and all the various areas uh, on my website that are filled with stuff that most people don't even know is there. I mean, I've talked to so many people that they say they've been on my website. They didn't see this. They didn't see that. They didn't look at this. So I'm just saying there's a lot of material on my website that a lot of people don't know. So if you go on my website, go through all of it. And there's three books in particular which uh, are, are dealing with what we're talking about tonight right on the homepage you might want to get. 
So there's a lot of stuff on my website. Scroll down and see it all. Now, second, in relation to that experience, I'm kind of hesitant to talk about it because my enemies and my detractors will use it to cram down my throat and and claim that I'm uh, you know mentally disordered or something because of my experience, but and they've they've done that because I I've talked about this one experience uh, actually on another radio program once and God I mean I was amazed the way that the uh, uh, people picked up on that and began to say that I was demonic I was uh, working for the devil and all no, kinds of strange you. stuff that I can testify to yeah. not you yeah. <clears throat> But uh, do we have a few moments? Yeah, we've got uh, six minutes or so. Okay, well, I back in 1959, <clears throat> I was 19 years old. I came to California, and I was in a restaurant in North Hollywood, just a 19-year-old kid bumping around the country and ended up in North Hollywood. And I'm sitting at the counter in a, in a restaurant in North Hollywood and sitting next to a young girl that was about oh, a couple of years younger than I, maybe 17, and so we got to talking and found out we both lived in the basic same area, uh, about three or four blocks from town. I had walked down to town, and she had also. So we started meeting in town on the weekends, and uh, we started hanging out together. And so when we would walk home, I lived about three blocks from town. She lived five. So she lived a couple blocks further than I did. So I never really knew exactly where she lived, but she knew where I lived. And so one night she came over to my place and she said, Jordan, my, my dad wants to talk to you. And I said, I'm not interested to talk to your dad. I've got nothing to say to him. And she said, no, no, he's a very interesting and important man, and he's got something to talk to you about. So I thought, that's interesting. So I said, okay. So I went with her. The moment I was walking up to her house, her father happened by chance to be coming out of the house. And the moment I saw him, my spirit felt. A presence that I have never felt before, and it was a euphoric, strange feeling uh, that I was in the presence of something very, very powerful. And but I, 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 I loved the feeling that I got from seeing him, but I didn't realize what I was doing. I mean, I didn't understand the feeling, but I, I it was very powerful. <clears throat> and he said, "Come on in." He pointed for us to come in. And so my girlfriend uh, and I went in the house, and her younger sister, Mary, was sitting on the floor uh, by the fireplace, and, and my girlfriend sat on the other side of the fireplace, and the mother was in the kitchen. And the father and I sat on the sofa. On one side he sat, and I was on the other side. And he was just talking, making small talk, and asking me how I like California and how's the job going mm -hmm. and this and that. And so I was feeling a little bit more safer and uh, because I was still feeling this strange feeling of, about him. And, but I, I it wasn't fearful. It was just an incredible spiritual uh, high being in this man's presence. So we're just sitting there chatting and talking, and then he says to me, he says, remember when you were eight years old back in Florida and you were uh, your dad had built a new back porch on your home because your house, uh, the back porch was, was uh, falling apart, and so he built a new back porch. And he said, remember how he used green lumber and it smelled kind of funny? And, and one night you were in bed and you were supposed to be in sleeping, but you got up and you were about eight years old, and you got up and you went out the back porch, remember? And he said, and you sat there picking the green lumber because it smelled funny, and you were picking it with your fingers, and the moon was out, and you talked to God that night, remember? Yes. And I was frightened. I, I, was, I didn't want to show tears in front of my girlfriend, but he frightened me. And he, said, and he looked at me very sternly, and, but not, not challenging me, but, but very sternly, and he said, well, did that happen or didn't it? And I said, well, yes, it did happen. And he said, well, how did I know that? And I said, I don't know how you know that. And he said, well, I know that because we were there. We saw you. And after all, you did ask God to do something important with your life. So we have brought you to California. And I said, what do you mean you brought me to California? And he said, why are you here? For what purpose did you come to California? And I said, I have no idea. I'm just here. I don't know why I'm here. He said, that's right. We have brought you here. He said, we have something for you to do later on in the, uh, toward the end of your life. 
but we have to train you. We are going to train you to do something for the human family, but uh, it's, it's going to take a long time for you to grow in wisdom and knowledge, but there will come a day when you will know what you have to do. And I was absolutely blown away by this man, and he began to tell me what I was going to do. He knew all about my life as a child. Uh, that was just an extraordinary experiment. And he simply vanished. And then one day, maybe a, a, a couple of months later, because I went out with him and his family and his wife and family two or three times. We had a great time, and he would sit and talk with us, even with his wife and, and girls. But he would talk with us about the gods in the spirit world and, and the ancient ones and all the ancient things that were going on in the world. And then one day I went over in the morning, one morning I went over to, to visit, and they were gone. The house was wide open. Empty. All, everything was gone, and I never heard from them ever again, ever. They were gone. That is one strange story, John. Oh, I'll tell you. It, it was, <laughs> but it really changed my life because um, this man knew all about my, my life as a child and the things he told me that I would, going, I would be doing later on in life. I now find myself doing exactly what he said I would be doing. I have some other great experiences I'd like to tell you about one day soon. Absolutely. Well, we're going to continue in just a moment. We're going to take phone calls next hour for both of you. Uh, Michael Tessarian, uh, where's your next conference, my friend? Uh, well, I've had to sort of, uh, I've been so preoccupied. We have a DVD movie coming out in a couple of weeks, you know, maybe even within about uh, 10 or 15 days. We're putting the final touches to uh, my first uh, uh, documentary movie that I've been doing with uh, Henrik Palmgren of uh, Red Ice Creations. Good for you. Yes, and it's actually the first of three. So, you know, I haven't been able to do too many live events because we've been, you know, hammering together a lot of these uh, products and some great new information. You never stop, Michael. Well, there's, look at what's going on in our world. Monumental things are happening. We've got to stay on top of it. We've got questions about 2012 and the future of mankind. This DVD, by the way, is called The Architects of Control. It's going to be a series in the Architects of Control um, series. There's going to be about three. First one's coming out, as I said, real soon, so people can go to the Michael Tassarian website, or they can just go straight to architectsofcontrol.com. We've got a, a preview up there so people can see what we've been right. doing there. You know. Yeah. Let's take phone calls when we come right back. Absolutely, and we've got an hour to go now with phone calls with Michael Tessarian, Jordan Maxwell, and you. So we'll do this when we come right back. Okay, we're going to take your phone calls in just a second with Jordan Maxwell and Michael Tessarian. And Michael, by the way, I just wanted to compliment you. Jordan already knows what I think of him. I wanted to compliment you on the work you've been doing all of these years as well. Um, helping society, I think, to open up their eyes before it's too late. I appreciate that, George, and, you know, it's always a pleasure to speak with you on these fascinating subjects, you know. I mean, it's really great. Uh, uh, one thing I would say about this latest book is that uh, we're, we're approaching sold-out status. Isn't that great? Already? Yeah, just in the five days. It was going good, to, <laughs> and then when Coast to Coast put up the um, Bang, it promo, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, okay. and I'd also make a note about that. If somebody goes online and they note, that it's in back order state status, they can still go ahead and order because it's smooth and it's very prompt. You'll still get a copy, no problem, just in case you, know, you notice that it's on, uh, we've made a note that it's on back order status. Okay. Just go ahead and, and process your order and, you know, we'll get you your book promptly anyway. Okay, let's go to the phones. Uh, you can uh, refer your question to either Michael or Jordan or both if you want. West of the Rockies, you are on with us, Vince. Hi, there. Hi, George. Uh, Jordan and uh, Michael, you, what a blessing the show is tonight. I, I have one simple question, and that is, do you believe that Jesus Christ was indeed God on earth? Well, I'll, I guess I'll take that first. Okay. No, I don't believe that <clears throat> Jesus Christ was God on earth. I have the highest of admiration. I have 35 different Bibles in my possession, which are on my shelves right here in front of me. <clears throat> I have the highest of admiration for everything uh, reported in the scriptures that Jesus has said. I live by those words. So uh, I, I have no problem with the words and the teachings attributed to Jesus, but I do not believe that Jesus was God uh, on earth or God at all because I believe God is too big for one religion. 
if you saw the movie uh, Contact at the very beginning of the movie was that beautiful rendition of how you're leaving the earth and going through space and going through deep space well any crea any creator that is powerful enough to create the whole universe uh, is not going to be able to you know it would not lower itself to be just a man on earth when we trace back where we got that concept from uh, we find that there are many many different religions that have uh, personified their gods in human form so I don't believe for a minute that Jesus was God no but I have the highest respect for spirituality for the Bible and for all the words of Jesus and you believe he could have been mystical as well, Jordan? <clears throat> of course, of yes. course. Yeah. All right, thanks. Next up, let's go to our East of the Rockies line, Tim in Illinois. Hey, Tim. Hey, how's it going, you guys? Good, we're well. I just uh, pretty much just have to let both of these gentlemen know that uh, the young people are waking up. Um, I'm only 27 years old. Um, you can see it on the YouTube channels. I mean, it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah and, I agree. Um, that's pretty much about it. Just to give a good comment. I mean, we are waking up. It's everywhere. What's it's, what's waking up the young people, Tim? What's happening? I don't know what it is. <laughs> I I really don't know what it is. I mean, it's. I haven't watched my TV in over a year now. Good. It's it's it it changes your whole reality. I mean, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's something divine. It's just I just woke up one day and just said I'm tired of it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well there's your there's your network uh, anecdote, uh, George. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it yeah, anymore. You absolutely. Know? Yeah. We don't need to know what it is. First, just get mad, fall in love with the word no, and just you know start evolving. You know, and you don't really need to know the mechanics of it yet. Just get with it. You know, that's the way it should happen. You know, I I grew up during the Vietnam era, and then I went to college, and you know did my thing, and did my nine years of service, and did my but I didn't go to Vietnam, nor did I see combat. But it wasn't until I watched the Forrest Gump movie did I look at that scene at Washington D.C. of all these people who were opposed to the war that I realized how right they were and how wrong so many people were then to chastise them. Now, I'm not talking about the troops because I think the troops coming back from Vietnam were, were, were not treated like the troops who have been in Iraq and Afghanistan. You know, we, we have more patriotism today with our troops than we did then. But the issue of the war in Vietnam at the time, people who were opposed to it were laughed at, and they were right. These people yeah. were right. McNamara lied. They all lied to us, yeah. Jordan. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you've seen that quote on my website of uh, Henry Kissinger in his book, Kiss the, Kiss the Boys Goodbye, uh, and Henry Kissinger's quote is devastating. Kissinger said, the military, uh, uh, the uh, soldiers are nothing but, uh, I can't even remember exactly. You need to go on my website and check out the box as quotes. But there was a devastating comment <clears throat> made by Kissinger concerning the military. He said that, uh, that they're nothing but just animals to be used in, in the slaughter. They couldn't care Jeez. less. They're just animals to be used in the slaughter to uh, accomplish our goals. So we just use people. If they get killed, who the hell cares? They're just GIs, which is a government issue. You know, be, before Ho Chi Minh ran to the arms of the Chinese, he begged us to work with him. Yeah. He begged us, and yeah. we, we yeah. turned our back on him, and, uh, and everything fell apart. Well, yeah, because there's a whole scheme going on behind the scenes that we don't understand. So that's all there well, is to it. That's true. Well, well, I've said so many times that if you have a, if you have a, a two-story building and you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor, the first thing to do, if you if you got any sense at all, is to go downstairs with a building inspector and go up on a ladder and see, uh, look at the the foundations of that second floor before you go building on. That, it. that makes sense, Jordan. Well, of course, <laughs> but 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 what you're doing then is you're standing under the foundation you're going to build on, and that's where we get the term understanding, because if you're not standing under. Uh, the thing you're, you're building your life on, being uh, if you're not researching and studying, you know, you may be getting a beautiful home for half price. Yeah, but it's on a, it's, it's sitting on the San Andreas fault, and that's why it's going so cheap. So you need to do some homework and study for your 
own edification as to where things come from because ignorance is killing the human race. Yeah, and when you've got a criminal syndicate operating every aspect of your life and who doesn't mind sacrificing your sons and fathers, you know, in the wars that they have manufactured, right, which I, I'm glad to see, like Tim the caller was saying there, you know, there's a YouTube generation, this is happening, people are getting aware of some of this stuff that wars have been contrived. They're not based on anything real. They're certainly, you know, contrived. Well, then start studying the criminal syndicates, these power brokers that Jordan and I are referring to, you see, who, who would do this, who would manipulate this, start studying their psychic profile to find out what makes them tick, uh, find out what weapons they're using, and find out how you can ultimately, see, uh, become immune to it. Because once you find that anecdote, you know, it's like the Omega Man, that old movie with Charlton Heston, you know, once you, you can see and face the light, then you have nothing to fear. I'm starting you know, to do some research on uh, aspartame as a possible story. Yeah, yeah. And let me tell you, how that got approved is criminal. Yeah. Is criminal. That's right. No it, was on one, it was on the mind control. It was, wasn't it on the list of the mind control drugs? I mean, long ago? The acid within it was eating the brains of mice, yeah. and they got that approved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and it's a big story. I mean, I've got data on it now. I'm not ready for the show yet, but when I come out with it, some uh, some people who got that thing approved are going to turn and run the other way. They should, yep. George. I'm not. I, it's not a self-serving statement <clears throat> I want to make, but but it, it but I do want to say that I've got three books that are dealing with the exact subjects we're dealing with tonight, right on my home page. One is called Occult Theocracy, and it's over 500 pages of research into cults and sects and different movements and the different religious orders and where they've come from. And the second book right next to it is Symbol, Sex, and the Stars, one of the most incredible books I've ever read on explaining where the religious concepts and ideas in the world have actually come from. And then the third one is called Stellar Theology and Masonic Astronomy, uh, where the uh, it explains in detail the Masonic Order's use of, uh, of symbols, emblems, astral theology, and there's nothing evil about this. It is an educational tool to understand how the world really works, what these words really mean. And these three books in particular, I have loved. That's why I prominently put them on the home page because they're so extraordinarily interesting and fascinating reading. Uh, you need to wake up because your mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it's not open. You need to read and understand how the world really works around you. If you're really concerned about your spirituality, then you better start educating yourself spiritually. So true. Now, now, go ahead, Michael. Jordan, that uh, book um, by Lady Queensborough? Yes. A lot of people in history don't even realize that it was two women that are pretty much the pioneers of the conspiracy movement. Yeah, I know. Lady We're Queen talking Nesta Webster, Webster, right? Webster. Mm -hmm. Subversive uh, societies and secret, secret movements. Secret societies and subversive orders, yeah. Subversive orders, yeah, and the world conspiracy. And, uh, and also then Lady Queensborough's Edith Star Mill. So yeah. the book that Jordan was talking about there is a compendium. Anyone who's interested, for instance, in the IRA, uh, not just them, but any, any terrorist organization in the world, Lady Queensborough, who was married, you see, to one of these dignitaries in the British government, and who used to overhear a lot of this insider dealings. These are aristocrats, and she decided that the world had to know. She wouldn't keep silent like all the rest of the ladies and, you know, and the wives of these cigar-smoking, you know, uh, tweed suit-wearing English dignitaries at the turn of the century. She refused to stay quiet and basically start then researching this because she had overheard her husband and all of these different uh, parliamentarians and all the shenanigans that they get up to, you see, and people who are interested in these secret societies. This book is amazing. And, and this uh, is, our, and this you is know, the know, She goes into the history of the IRA yeah. in Ireland. You know, Irish men don't even understand it, that the Orange Lodge and the IRA, which originally was the Irish Republican Brotherhood, which is connected to the ancient order of Hibernians, which is connected to Theobald Wolf Tone and the Freemasons. You see, all of these... Uh, potentates and individuals who were at the heart of these organizations, they appear as political edifices to the world. But they were actually Masonic secret societies in their inception, and that's who's been funding them, the Black Hand, the underground movement, these Templar associations out of France and Scotland and England, you see, and in Rome also. 
this book is, is fundamental. And so the other books that Jordan mentioned are really, these are reference works. This is what we refer to as reference works. I refer to them in my work. And people need to build up a library, you know, a small library or a big library, try to get hold of some of these rare and unique works, which are very rare and hard to find in the world today, like I was saying earlier about the works of uh, Gerald Massey. And also these books are e-books. You don't have to wait for the mail. Just e download them now. Yeah. But and, and the reason why I think this is important and I'm saying this is because I'm not sure how much longer um, my website will be allowed to be up. So, you know, you better – Check my website out while it's still here, because uh, who knows what will happen tomorrow. Good point. Let's go to our wild card line, Ralph in Texas. Go ahead, Ralph. Hello. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Loud and clear. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Have uh, any of you ever read a book by Peter Mace? I read it back in the 1980s. It was called In God's Name. It was about the death of John Paul II. Oh, have a just. Oh, have a just. There's about seven different books. David Yeller uh, did one of the best ones. But there's uh, seven different books I have on that one subject. Yeah, the, the killing of the Pope and how he died on the 33rd day. Um by poison. Yeah, there's, there's, like I said, there's at least seven good books written on that one subject, and that, incidentally, was the basis for Godfather 3, the third in the series. So uh, go check out the uh, Godfather, the third one in the series. That's what it was all about, the killing of the Pope. Okay, I didn't know that, but yeah. it, 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 it clearly showed the kid, uh, evidence that the church had been overthrown from the inside. You know, oh, that's yes. right. Oh, heaven, yes. And this is what we need to also understand because some of the latest mainstream shows that, uh, you know, maybe come on PBS in America or maybe come on, the, you know, sort of these highbrow, high, not highbrow, but high profile uh, media oracles. The lies that they disseminate. So one of the other issues, you know, which I really have to emphasize is that people need to come to those scholars who have some sort of, you know, knowledge and background in this subject is because now uh, you probably noticed, Ralph, and other listeners have probably noticed that a lot of the subject matter is leaking into the mainstream. And some of that is not good because it's the 70-30 split. It's 70 percent, you know, lies, 30 percent truth. Uh, people have realized that there's a change in the tide, a sea change, that people in the world are getting interested in this information. So the establishment forces just don't sit there and, you know, uh, ignore that. They also get with it. They often co-opt the information of people like Jordan Maxwell, and they run with it with no credit to the man, no credit to the, the Gerald Masseys of the world, you see, and then they co-opt it, they re package it in their own form, they dumb it down, and they plunk it up there for everybody on the Discovery Channel or A&E uh, with big statements like the Illuminati has nothing to do with the Vatican, you know, or, you know, the, the Yale University, is, you know, it's like, you know, uh, Santa Claus has got nothing to do with Christmas, you know, this kind of palava. And, of course, if, if you have never listened to Coast to Coast, if you've not researched, the, you know, Jordan or myself or any of these people, you might be exposed to that information for the first time through the television. And therefore, you're going to now be learning all the bad habits, all the wrong information, and that will steer you even more in the dark, you see. So we have to be aware that the channels, the TV, is also somewhat co-opting some of this information in exactly the way, same way it did with the New Age movement. Not because they really want to educate people, but, but because they want to confuse people and put in so many red herrings and so many false leads that in the end you're exacerbated, you see, because your general natural curiosity and your natural interest in these subject matters can also be subverted by the mainstream. They may give you some elements of truth, but you can better believe they ain't going to be talking about the depth you know, that we are talking about, about Ireland, about the Druids, about the secret symbolism, you know, about all of these uh, ancestral and esoteric things. So bear in mind what Jordan is saying. You know, there is no longevity here with what we're doing. You know, we're in, in, the, in, in the target. You know, we're in the uh, crosshairs, you know. And we've also got this barrage now of dumbed-down soundbite material coming on the television that is trying to do justice to this esoteric, the founding of America, you know, the lost Ark of the Covenant, whatever. It's plagiarized, it's stolen, it's packaged, it's, it's revamped, and it's stuck on there with, you know, it's pretty much ridiculous. I mean, some of the stuff I've seen myself.
I'm <laughs> saying this because I've sat and watched it. You know, stuff on the Freemasons and whatnot, and it's bunk. You know, it's absolutely riddled with inconsistencies and, and, and half-truths and, and fallacies. And I, I'm worried. I'm, in one way, I, my heart is glad to see that this information is getting on the mainstream, but then, of course, it's soured by the fact that you know it's being misrepresented. So a message of caution to people that they need to go to those people who've really done the homework and are not just critting a, you know, a, 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 you know, a 30 minute or a 60 minute fiasco, you know, which is going to going to make it make the issue and these subjects even more complex. Uh, George, you yeah. know, in the movie, uh, <clears throat> not National Treasure, uh, Da Vinci Code, mm -hmm. uh, at the very beginning of the movie, uh, um, what's his name, uh, the star of Da Vinci Code? That was Tom Hanks. Tom right? Hanks. Yep. Tom Hanks is, is introduced, he's, in an audi he's uh, sitting in an audience, and he's been introduced as a next speaker, and he's going to do a slide presentation. And they introduce him as the world's foremost ex expert on occult secret societies and symbols, <laughs> right? And he walks up on the stage, <clears throat> and he's standing in front of a of the uh, uh, of the screen. And on the screen is being projected a slide presentation, and on the screen is the pyramid with the all on the back of the dollar bill. Now he walks in front of the screen and is pointing out. The symbols on the do, on the on the uh, dollar bill, <clears throat> pointing to the all-seeing eye, and talking about the Illuminati. Uh, that uh, that is on my uh, basic slide presentation done ten years before. Exactly, I'm standing on the stage, uh, walking in front of the uh, the uh, screen with the uh, back of the dollar bill being projected Same on thing. the screen. Identical. Same thing. We'll be back with final phone calls in just a moment on Coast to Coast AM. You know, whether you're 24 or 64, your health should be very important to you. And how much you care about your family, that's also very important as well. So our next Coast to Coast program, we're going to be talking about alternative medicine, efforts to keep you alive as long as possible. I think you're going to enjoy the program with the specialists and guests who will be coming in to tell you some things that you can do for yourself because i got to tell you, nobody else will. And also in the first hour for just a bit as a news item, Harriet Fellman from St. Louis will join us. She has multiple sclerosis and will tell us how she put together a group to come up with a novel idea to help people with MS as well. 400,000 cases uh, of all the time in this country. And uh, we'll be back in a moment with the rest of your calls at Coast to Coast Down. Jordan, the incredible Internet sensation movie Zeitgeist has a lot to do with you. Tell me about it. Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, Peter Joseph Morella in New York <clears throat> uh, actually produced that two-hour sensation that uh, was well over the last time I looked at about four or five months ago, it was at uh, 15 million downloads uh, off of Google alone. It's called Zeitgeist. And uh, as a matter of fact, he actually said on a radio talk show uh, that he based the entire work on on my work. He, he based the entire movie on my work that I inspired him to, uh, to do that uh, to our video. And uh, I was amazed. I didn't know anything about it. So somebody called and told me, did you know that there's a movie out there called Zeitgeist based on your work? And uh, the guy's name was Peter Joseph Morella, and you can go out and check it out and watch it yourself on the Google. It's called Zeitgeist, Z-E-I-T-G-E-I-S-T. Is there a comic book uh, coming out with you on it, too? You know, I've already got three of them out there. Yeah, ah, do you? Okay. Yeah, go on. As a matter of fact, I've got the, uh, it's right on my home page. If you scroll down, you'll see the whole comic book series. Uh, there's a whole comic book series been done on me, and uh, that was amazing to me. I didn't know anything about it until it happened. <laughs> and, uh, there's one thing I want to clarify quickly before I forget it, and I, I need to do this. When I'm talking about secret societies and fraternal orders, what I am not talking about is your local Masonic Lodge. I'm not talking about a Masons in America because I know I'm way. Glad you're way pointing too, that out too. Buddy. Yeah, I know way too many Masons who are who are dear friends of mine, who are who are on my side on this issue, who are very concerned about our our republic and 
our country, and they, you know, they're very, very well aware of all of the dangers facing us in this world. And so I'm not talking about the Masons in America and the Masonic Lodge in your hometown. When I'm talking about secret societies, I'm talking about the real secret societies, these ancient fraternal orders operating in Europe, uh, especially in, in Italy. There's a lot of uh, stuff been going on in, in Italy. Of course, you know, for, for over 2,300 years, Rome has dominated Europe under the Caesars. And then for 1,600 years or so, the Vatican has dominated Europe. So when I'm talking about secret societies, I'm talking mostly and mainly about the occult orders of religion and secret societies in Rome. And, uh, and in Europe that have been causing devastation around the world and the royalty that's connected behind the scenes to these these secret orders that are just decimating the, the human race on the earth. I'm not talking about the good and decent people here in America who are, belong to Masonic orders. So I just want to make sure that everyone understands. The, the guys in the Masonic orders in America I have no problem with at all. I'm talking about some real ancient old things which have been going on in Europe. And think about it. Rome has dominated Europe for over 2,300 years. And Europe has dominated the world for 2,300 years. So not America. We need to look at Europe and all of these ancient occult orders that have been operating behind religions and, and governments. Oh. <clears throat> so if I may interject there, uh, Jordan. Go ahead, how, how, how where did we get our information, if not from whistleblowing Masonic writers who wrote most of my library? Of course. I mean, all, I mean, so much of what I've been able to, to, to uh, glean from my research has come from Masonic writers and brilliant men in American Freemasonry who have, who have given their lives for this country and given knowledge and wisdom to us that we would never have had. So, and besides, you, you know, go back and look at the Constitution. It was signed by Freemasons. So I'm not con condemning Masonic orders in America. And incidentally, that's another very important point. America is the only country in the world ever to have a written Constitution which guaranteed our freedom of speech and our freedoms that we have uh, come to rely on. That is very important. That's but Jordan, extremely important. Jordan, remember in the Constitution, the Founding Fathers, made, it was the first time in history that they divided the state from the so-called church so that people would have the freedom not only to have religious freedoms, but that it wouldn't infiltrate you know, the political uh, That's exactly maneuvering right. of desperate, despotic, soulless, moralist, Creatures would not be able to, you know, uh, present themselves as religious, religiously to a religious population who knew better, who was educated. I think the point that we've been making on this show is that people have become so dumb, done they've forgotten about this, and they are taking these charlatans, these wolves in sheep's clothing, That's exactly who hide right. behind the guise of religion. Yeah, of all I mean, religion. Our, our government in America is crawling with. Uh, secret societies out of Europe, out of Germany. I mean, skull and bones, that was a symbol for the Gestapo in Nazi yeah. Germany, for God's sakes, wake up. That was the symbol for the Nazi empire, was skull and bones. Yeah, the fasche on the back of and, the congressman, yeah. as you so many times pointed out, was an old Roman symbol. So we are, we are being controlled and manipulated by exactly the same forces that were operating in Europe for millennia. These people are very smart. That's exactly right. Americans have no idea in the world about the history of Europe and its devastating effect on the whole world. And I'm saying if you really want to get down to, and this is my opinion based on 48 years of, of my involvement in this story, look at British royalty today and yeah. look at the Vatican and watch the, the manipulation of a, and exploitation of the human race by Rome. I'm telling you, there's something very big here. They're telling you in movies like Godfather, and especially Godfather 3, where even in Godfather 3, they show the connections between Mafia, Lugosa Nostra, the underworld, the black hand, especially P2, Propaganda Due, the P2 Lodge of Freemasonry that's in the movie, Godfather 3. Go watch it. And uh, be very, very aware of these pompous, un under-informed or manipulative mainstream shows that try to co-opt 
the work of people like Jordan, to dumb it down and then try to tell you that there's no connection between all these different organizations. You know, there's a hydra. Jordan's always explained that it's two hands serving the same brain. Don't fall for this new leaking propaganda that is dealing with this subject matter, but skewing it so that you don't see the truth. In America, and so that, uh, actually, uh, what they're doing is they're creating internecine they're, they're creating internecine fights between factions because divide and rule the British Empire, right? All colonialists and even those who are trying to colonize your mind, they don't just co these people don't just colonize countries and nations and wipe out indigenous peoples and destroy all around them. They also try the colonization, as Jordan was talking earlier, about the human mind, the human soul, the human sensibility. That's what they're really feeding on. Exactly. And therefore, these media oracles are in their pocket. Henry Luce was a, was it Knights of Columbus or Knights Templar, yep. you yep. know? And every media org from Conrad Black to Catherine Graham and the whole Smithsonian institutes that fund all the archaeologists to seed all their lies uh, about the world, we have to be immune to what they're feeding us because it might look attractive, but they've just co-opted, just exactly like the way you said that in the beginning of the Da Vinci Code, the Langdon character stands up in front of slides that are basically taken straight out of Jordan's early work with no mention and reference to the guy, you know? So I, I've, I've been watching this for a long time, what is going on, and it's sickening to me how many Americans are totally unaware, unread, and are not alert to how this thing is being played. But they're waking up, Jordan, slowly. Well, slowly. They, are waking up. they are waking up, you see, but we also have to be sensitive to, I don't know, it's just a thing with me, we have to be reverent and respectful not only to the knowledge but to the purveyors of the knowledge. Just because Jordan doesn't go around with a crown on his head and some silk slippers and the ring of the fisherman or whatever, you know, doesn't mean that he's not himself a noble and brilliant man for doing this. I've always said that if statues and bronze were put in every town and city of America, it would still not be enough of a accolade to this man and his life's work. You know, and this I is a fact of the matter. Kindness. I appreciate your, your comments. I, <clears throat> well, I feel, as I've said so many times, I feel so much better just saying I'm an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. I, I've always been fascinated with uh, other things which other people don't even know exist. But, Jordan, see, so you have your supporters and everything. But I gotta, I gotta tell people who maybe even checking in here for the first time. Maybe you know they've come to this show for the first time. They'll be listening to it. You know, I personally am mortified. It's the only word I can think of. Mortified to my very core that you know you've had the treatment that you've had in your own country, and how people have slandered you, and how people have you know tried to destroy your reputation and worse, and how they've ripped you off. You know, I've, I know the stories. I've heard it. I've backed it up. I've corroborated it. I'm not going to name any names here, but. It's absolutely more. The only term I can think of is mortifying that su such a man, a gentleman as you, a pursuer of knowledge, a servant of truth, could be so mistreated as I can't even, I don't even want to get into it because it's so. Well, it's all right, let's, let's take some final calls, guys. Yes. Wild card line, Matt in Pennsylvania. Go ahead, Matt. They must find it difficult, those who have taken authority as the truth rather than truth as the authority. Yeah. I've to make such a profound statement that surely shows the level of enlightenment that Gerald Massey did attain throughout his career studying Egyptology and symbolism. Yeah. And I wanted to commend you three gentlemen for sharing your level of enlightenment to the world in the hope that you know, everyone who's listening and not just hearing can attain that truth that's necessary to reverse what's been done all throughout the world, like you guys were speaking of. Yeah. And I also wanted to commend, uh, excuse me, I wanted to commend Jordan for. You know, I know he didn't maybe work exact, work with Peter Joseph Morello with for Zeitgeist, but that's how I was first introduced to Jordan's work through that. And yes, it, it was an integral part of the movie. It wouldn't have been the same without that. And I just wanted to ask Jordan a few questions. Have you spoken with Peter Joseph Morella about the upcoming addendum to Zeitgeist? And you know, I am glad that you guys are speaking about this because everyone needs to know about this. And secondly, I know you mentioned the symbol of Obama, and I just wanted to comment on the fact that. I know this is a big news story that he stripped the American flag from yeah, from his not plane. his 757. I'm sorry. Okay, not his 757, but you know the one that we paid for and replaced it with his with, symbol, which to me is indicative that you know that's the you know his stripping of national sovereignty of America and you know promoting this globalist agenda. Well, and more than that, your, your your name was Matt, right? Yeah, that's Matt. Matt, you see, it's more than that. By doing that, by taking the stars and stripes off that jet, he is making a symbol that he does not work. 
for America or for Americans. These are scions, lackeys, minions of the British Empire and what lies behind the British Empire. I'm not, also, I'm not implicating British people here. We're talking about an establishment that's run from London that is millennia old. The, every politician that you basically have in America for the longest period of time, certainly going back to Roosevelt, has been working for this oligarchy in Europe, you see. And he is showing you symbolically all the show. We've been talking about the symbols and watch for them. And you're right on the ball there. By the take end of that flag, I have a link that shows this, that goes to the news story about this, uh, a section on Obama and his elite, uh, you know, his elite uh, heritage and whatnot. And he is showing the American people in symbolic form. They're not going to say it. These are sheeps and wolf, wolves in sheep's clothing. So, of course, they'll always come out with the right words because words are, can confuse and deceive as well as they can enlighten and instruct. But symbolism, that's your bottom line. That's what you go by. Now, when this creature did that, when that creature did that, he is telling you, I do not work for America. When the bush is shaking the hands of the British Queen, when he's lowering his head and bowing to these potentates standing on a red carpet, they're telling America loud and clear through symbolic communication, we don't work for you, we work for these masters. I told you that when I saw Obama's symbol for his, uh, for his campaign, I was absolutely shocked. I know what that symbol means, and virtually nobody around me uh, is aware of what that symbol actually, where it comes from, what it means. But he's not the only one. John McCain knocked me over when he uses terms which I know German secret societies use, <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the classic Illuminati terms which uh, Hillary Clinton uses. I think, and my God, is there anyone running for office in this country that's actually honest and is not on the take? But if you don't understand the symbols and the words and the terms, and if you're not a student of the occult phrases and how this stuff really works behind the scenes, you're never going to figure out who these people really are. But I'll tell you what is going to happen. You're going to wake up one morning and find out it's finished. America is done. It's over. And the American people loved it. They went and voted for it. They couldn't get enough of it. And they re didn't realize what the symbols meant. They, they never saw it coming. Just like the Nazis. They were, the German people just loved it. They, they, they had the new roads. They were all eating for the first time. They had all kinds of great new things in Germany. They never figured out what the real name of the tomb was until it was too late. David I in mean, British Columbia, let's take one or two more calls and we'll wrap things oh, up here. Hey, go ahead, David, real quickly. Oh, okay. Um, I'm kind of uh, occult practitioner, and uh, been uh, had some training or teacher in the in the early '80s. Anyway, so I, I wanted to thank your guests for the great work they do. I just wanted wondered uh, I wanted to ask, uh, does does I think it helps uh, like kind of the uh, ceremonial work that maybe a lot of people like me do to try to bring light into our experience and into our culture and into our human uh, consciousness. If it works for you, if it works for you, it works for everybody else. All you've got to worry about, don't worry about what, when you're dealing with a ritualistic kind of mindset or trying to, you know, bring psychic hygiene mm -hmm. and moral hygiene and find your own center, and by using any, because look, my goodness, look how much ritual we're talking about is involved with the, the royals, you see, and, and all of the different potentates we've been describing. Look how important ritual is in their life. Of course, it's important to bring elements of ritual into your life. There's nothing negative about it. But, you know, if it works for you, if it gives you stability and you insight, and if it, most importantly, if it strengthens your psychic immunity, I mean, here, how can we talk about political sovereignty in the world, right? And, and financial sovereignty and all of these other securities, if man doesn't have it in his core structure, if man doesn't have it within his soul, the man who's not sovereign within himself, the man who doesn't own his own selfhood, how can that man do any kind of good in the world politically, charitably, or uh, religiously, or anything else He's in the world? A slave. Michael Tessarian, in as much as... Uh... I pay you the handsome sum of zero dollars to appear on the show. Get your website out, would you? Thank you, George. Uh, well, the uh, book is uh, on astrotheology.net. Just go. The easiest way is just to go to michaeltasarian.net. That's a navigation page to the book and also to the Architects of Control uh, website, which is uh, you know the film we've got coming out in a very very short time. And we've got, of course, you, Jordan, jordanmaxwell.com. Yes, sir. Jordan, I will see you in Santa Maria next weekend. Right too. Okay, my friend. Michael, thank you so much.
Thank you very much. Thank you, George. Thanks for the time. And uh, thank you, Jordan. Uh, I'm glad I got a moment here to pay homage to you. You're a great man. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, George, for having us on. Absolutely. These two guys know what they're talking about. In a very difficult subject of symbolism, the occult, they know what they're talking about. For Karis Coburn, Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladisor, Ross Mitchell, George Nappy, and Punnett and Art Bell, I'm George Norrie. Somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.